This is Beyond the Culture. Let's go. I'm so excited that you took the time to join us on the next episode of Beyond the Culture. This is the show where we embrace change and challenge cultural norms and ideals. I'm your host, Dr. David Walker. So how you doing, man? I'm doing, I'm doing great today. You know, thank you so much for having me. Um, it is certainly great to be here. I, actually, I was looking forward to being here on today. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is going to be a, uh, a great conversation that we're going to have. But uh, before we get it, let me just give you your formal introduction because we want to know uh, who our guest is today. And my guest is uh, Pastor Frederick Guyans. Uh, he is the chairman at the Guyans Group LLC. He works as a certified John Maxwell speaker, trainer, and coach at the John Maxwell team. I found out that he's a former pro football player. Uh, he, was, uh, a, he had a successful career uh, as a financial advisor working on Wall Street. Uh, he has appeared on radio, done seminars, hosted conferences uh, for churches, men's conferences, colleges, and universities. Uh, he is the senior pastor at the Blessed Church in Philadelphia, PA, and he is the author of a soon uh, coming book called The Gold Standard, How to Achieve One Big Goal and Do It Again and Again and Again. So I'm super excited to have my guest on the show, uh, Pastor Frederick Gyans. God bless you, Pastor. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, sir. God bless you as well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I, I, I'm just so glad you're here. And um, we're just going to have a great conversation. And I, I want to start, well, let me just get a little bit about your backstory, you know, where you're from. I know your, your, your church is in Philadelphia, but are you from Philly? Is that where you were born and raised? Just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I am, I am from Philadelphia. Uh, about the eighth grade, uh, my mother remarried a gentleman from uh, New Jersey. So then we re relocated to New Jersey, and I went to high school in New Jersey, then on to college, and then eventually found my way back to Philadelphia. So yes, I'm a I'm a, I consider myself a Philadelphian. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I didn't tell you this, but I was born in Philadelphia, right there at uh, Temple University. Okay. Uh, broad broad okay. and Ty Tioga, I believe it is. So, so I'm a, I, I wasn't raised in Philadelphia. I was raised in New York, but that's my birth town. And uh, I'm so glad to have been born in Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. <laughs> so, so good, that's good, Austin. Good. So, so you, 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 you were born in Philadelphia, raised uh, in New York, and, I mean, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, but now it said you had a, you were a professional football player. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I was fortunate enough uh, to go on to college um, on a football scholarship. And as a result, you know, I was able uh, uh, to play. Um, I signed with the Kansas City Chiefs in 1994. And then I was released and I played in a league called the Arena Football League for two years. Mm. Um, so whenever you're compensated, you know, for your talent, that's considered being a professional. So sure. certainly I, I had the experience of, uh, of being a professional football player. Uh, that's awesome. And, and um, you know, I'm an avid sports fan. Uh, do you follow anybody now? Eagles, Giants, who's your team? Now? Uh, <laughs> Get ready for this. Okay. I, I am. I am a Dallas cat. I am a diehard oh. since 1979. Since 1979. Listen, the the 1980s were very tough for me. The 90s were good. Uh huh. It, it, it's been tough ever since. But I've been. But I've been rocking with them since 1979. <laughs> Lord Jesus, another one of them boys. <laughs> I have a family full of them. And uh, at the beginning of every season, I hear uh, number six. <laughs> we, go, we go on for number six, and then somewhere around uh, late November, December, 
uh, they start looking towards next year. And I think this is that another year of looking to next year. <laughs> but, 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 I, but I'm not going to hold that against you being my guest. I, I, I appreciate you. But uh, so, 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 yeah, so you play some professional football and that's good. But then you also went to Wall Street. You had mm-hmm. some, some time at Wall Street. Talk about mm-hmm. that because you are your financial advisor, it said. Yeah, you know, my, my goal in life, you know, at the time, you know, everything I've done since a child okay. was to prepare me, you know, to excel at, at playing football at, at a high level. And when that didn't work out, I didn't really have a, a dream or, or vision for my life at the time. And there was a man that had some credibility uh, in my life at the time. You know, he simply said, you know, I think you'll make a good stockbroker. Mm. So be, because, you know, I believed in what he thought about me, then I, I kind of went that route and I b- went on to work for two major Wall Street firms. Um, but here's the thing, Dr. Walker, um, you know, certainly I had some su- great success doing that, you know, especially coming from where I was, you know, to having, you know, multi-million dollar clients and things of that nature. But it was still borrowed vision. Okay. You know, it wasn't an idea that came from me. It was an idea that came from someone else. So after a while, you know, uh, after, you know, some years of, of doing that, you know, I began to pay attention to my longing and discontent. And that led me a, a different route in life. All right. So where did it lead you? Well, it, it led me into the ministry. Okay. You know, certainly I transitioned, you know, into the ministry and I was in, itinerant minister uh, for several years, traveled the world, uh, preached overseas, held conferences. um, And then that led me to planting my my own church uh, 11 years ago. Okay. And then, uh, you know, with that. Yeah, but before we go go into that, and and, and I do want to go there and talk about ministry, Mm -hmm. uh, because that's that's very important. I want to go back a little bit about the financial Mm -hmm. um, experience that you have. And the reason why I ask that is because, you know, being African Americans, yes. um, finances has always been an issue. Yes. Uh, multi generational wealth has been a challenge for for Black people. You know, two hundred years of America, four hundred years since uh, the first Africans came to America mm-hmm. uh, on a slave ship. Mm-hmm. We have never arrived there. And you already said. I think you said you had at least a couple of multi-million dollar clients. Mm -hmm. So I want you to just to talk a little bit about finances and financial wealth relative to, to black people. Just hit on that a little bit. Well, you know, you know, certainly um, I, I just believe that for the African American community, um, I, I do believe that we have thoughts about it, but it's just the discomfort with exposing ourselves, you know, to wealth building and things of that nature. And I say that because initially, you know, the environment made me very uncomfortable. Mm. You know, I am competing with Caucasian, Caucasian men uh, who had such a head start on me, you know, as it relates to the culture and the language of, of, of wealth building. Um, but, you know, I've learned that, um, you know, the more and more that I stay involved in the environment, then I can also normalize uh, that thought process in terms of wealth building as well. So I think that, you know, as it relates to the African-American community, we see things as so distant mm. or you know, there are times that we just feel like certain ideas might outclass us. Right. Um, and, and to be honest, as stated, you know, I had that feeling as well until I realized that this environment is for me and not just for me, it's an, an environment where I was called to flourish in. So I just think that um, it, it, it's the exposure and, and taking the, the baby steps and not allowing the newness of, of the idea of, of wealth, you know, push us back to environments that we really don't want to be in. You know, here's what you just said, and I just grabbed a hold to it. You talked about, many African Americans believing that great prosperity and great wealth is beyond them or unreachable or unattainable. And, and really, you know, you're talking about a mindset, right? You know, you were in a place and it helped to 
like you started out saying maybe I had some deficiencies and some mm -hmm. thoughts that I didn't have what it takes, but then your mind shifted. Mm -hmm. And then you realize you were just on par with all the rest of them, which is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that a lot of times as a, as a people, and you are so right, that we don't think it's for us. We mm -hmm. see it for them. Mm -hmm. And we, we've had that mindset primarily because of slavery Mm -hmm. And we didn't have anything mm -hmm. that we, we live in the, in the, what I call the mindset of content, mm -hmm. you know, all right, well, if I don't get it, I'll just, whatever I have, that's enough. And we'll just keep making it instead of erasing that mind mm -hmm. and then have a mind that says, no, I don't have enough and I can have more. And God mm -hmm. wants me to have more. Would you agree to that? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, and you hit it right on the point, Dr. Walker. I, it's, it's a it's a mindset and it's a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And you know the the African American community has left so much life and so much money and so much real estate and so much opportunity and success and prosperity on the table because we've been a, a people that has been without for so long that look like like it's hard. It's 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 very difficult to convince a hungry person that there's more than crumbs in life. Right, right. You know, people who are hungry, you know, they're satisfied with crumbs. Yes. And it's, and it's very difficult to tell a hungry person to bypass the crumbs and go after the loaf. Mm. And I think that, you know, that's, that's how they think. Right. You know, it, it's like, hey, my, my parents, you know, have had generational poverty. Okay. Or, or generational, they were generational renters. Right, right. Um, or they did own homes, but the value was just minimized. And now it's like, well, I have a, a, a house that's, that's valued at around $300,000. I'm content with that I've arrived. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in reality, you know, you, you forget to, you fail to look past what's beyond where you are. And I think that, you know, that is the mindset that we have to have. You know, we need expansion because there is so much more, you know, for us to have and uh, lifestyles for us to live and also to pass down if we just simply accept the ideas that, that are beyond our, our normal comfort. I want you to speak to one more thing before we, we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, consumers versus producers. Because mm -hmm. when I hear about the black community, Mm -hmm. They talk about in terms of consumers, we're mm -hmm. multi-billion dollars. The numbers are just astronomical mm -hmm. when it comes to consuming. Mm -hmm. But we don't find ourselves as producers enough. Can you talk, talk about that, uh, being a consumer and being a producer? Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, you can't buy identity. Mm -hmm. You can't. You can't buy success. It, it, it's either who you either have it or you don't. Okay. And I think that, you know, consumption, you know, comes from, you know, comes from a person in, in a community that, that operate at emotional deficits. Mm -hmm. In other mm -hmm. words, I'm, I don't have a lot of self value. So I'm going to try to purchase value. I'll, I'll buy the Mercedes. I'll, I'll buy the name brand stuff. You know, the polo shirt and the Aza shirt is the same quality. But, but, but society says that the polo shirt has more value. So I'm going to just consume, 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 you know, trying to become uh, wealthy or, or try to have this identity of wealth. When in reality, you know, that mindset keeps us from being the producers that we are. Mm. There's a scripture in the Bible says, in the Bible, it says that a good man brings forth good treasure. I mean, brings forth good from the good treasure of his heart. Mm -hmm. A person can only produce outwardly who they are inwardly. And, and, and because we're not rich inwardly, we don't see ourselves as producers and creators inwardly. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, we don't produce on the outside. You know, right. God has, this whole system is created for, for, for the generation that we are called to, to be consumers of our gift and to be consumers of our productivity. That's, that's, that's the wealth system. The wealth system is creating value and then serving it to the generation that we live in. Mm -hmm. And until we adopt that way of living in that mindset, 
then we'll still be people who are just consumers, which, which, which increases, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't close the wealth gap, it, it increases the wealth gap. Right, right. So a changed mind will, will certainly decrease the, the wealth gap that, that we experience as African Americans, no question about it. You know, you, that's powerful what you just, um, what you just shared. And we, we have to change our minds because productivity, creativity is God given and he has given it to our people. But until that mind shifts and that mind changes, we'll still be in the same place. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, Absolutely. Still, we'll still be in the same place. So, so you, you went from, uh, I guess, as you said, working in someone else's vision Mm -hmm. and then moving to a vision that God has given you, mm -hmm. and that's uh, ministry. So just go ahead and tell us about how, how did it come about, and then, you know, what did God speak to your, your heart in terms of uh, starting a ministry? Well, you know, initially it was, um, it was very difficult for me uh, to, to embrace, embrace the call um, because what I've seen in ministry just wasn't me. You know, I'm a I'm more of a teacher. Okay. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a loud person, and uh, I I didn't think that I had that presence. So um, after you know uh, prayer and, and 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 counsel and things of that nature, you know, I decided to just show up who I am. Okay. And and I realized that there was a a ministry market for my gift, and I've traveled the world. Uh, you know, being myself teaching and things of that nature, as an itinerant uh, minister, I was with George uh, C. Wright um, at Abundant Life Family Worship Church in New, Brunswick, New Jersey for 13 years mm -hmm. uh, before I was sent out to start uh, the Blessed Church. And, uh, you know, I started that church from scratch. It was just an idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I wanted to, to be closer to where I was. Um, but the Lord told me to, Hey, I want you to go down into Philadelphia. And, uh, since then we've been operating at a high le level of ministry for the last 11 years. So, so how has, has it been, uh, so, so talk about the community that you serve. Mm -hmm. Um, just, just so speak about that, the community that you serve and what you're doing in the community. Okay. Uh, when you say community, do you mean in terms of geographically or the community of people? Uh, yeah, I guess the community of people. Okay. Most, you know, there's a, there's a different identity that comes from, from each and every church. Every church is, is, is different and who they're called to serve and things of that nature. You know, most of the people who attend our, our services are, are creatives. Okay. You know, they're, they're people who are looking for transition. Um, we have professionals uh, in our church. Uh, uh, we've had, you know, some of the Philadelphia Eagles coaches, mm -hmm. you know, attend our services. Um, so we serve people uh, who, are, who are progressives. Um, that isn't by accident. I just believe it's, it's who we are as a ministry. Okay. And also, you know, we, we also understand that, you know, to your point earlier, they're creators and producers in the mix of where we are. And 80% of, of the ministry that comes out of the church is not fundamental Christianity. Okay. 80% of the ministry that comes from our church is about bringing people into alignment with the biggest idea that God has for their life, mm. you know, so it's getting them to look beyond the comfort. One thing about God is that, you know, the same job or the same comfort that God gave you is the same comfort he'll ask for you back later. And I don't think that people realize that, you know, certainly, you know, God did open up the doors and God didn't give you the job or the life you currently have. But at some point he'll ask you for that life back. He'll prune that life to or, in order to get more out of you. So those are some of the ideas uh, that we share because most of the people in our congregation, they have a measure of comfort. Okay. You know, they, they've, they've created good, but now it's time to go from, from good to great and to reach our, and to maximize who we are as a people, as a church. You know, I, I, I like 
the, the, the philosophy, the foundation, you know, of your ministry, um, because, you know, in many ways, you know, I, you know, we love our foreparents, you know, mm-hmm. our, our, our grandparents, our, our bishops and our pastors from yesteryear. Yeah. But a lot of times we got locked into yes. more spirituality yes. versus at least having a balance between spirit and natural. Yes. Uh, understanding that, and I guess we'll, we'll repeat this word again, you know, how God has put it, put in all of us a creativity mm-hmm. that is not necessarily supposed to be uh, just aligned or focus on the, the four walls of the church. Absolutely. It, it's supposed to go out into the marketplace, you know, yes. and impact, you know, the world in the name of Jesus. And Absolutely. so it sounds like that's exactly what's going on over there at the blessed church and you got the right name, the blessed church, you know? <laughs> um, and so that, so that's, that's a uh, 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 really out, outstanding. So, uh, so you said 11 years you've been in, in, in ministry, right? Yep. Well, at least that pastor in that church. Yes. Okay. Um, and so, so your pastor, which is good, but you, you're not limited to pastoring. And I love this. You're not limited to pastoring. Um, you're also, you know, what we call a motivational speaker, a public speaker. Mm-hmm. And I have you listed as a certified John Maxwell speaker. That has a special mm-hmm. name, John Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trainer and coach. So talk about your public speaking business um, and how, it, how has that gone for you? Well, you know, in, in traditional church environments, they tell you that once you're called to the ministry, that's all you can ever be. Mm. And I wrestled with that for years because although I believe that God positioned me to do what I'm doing, there was still a downside to it that most people don't talk about. Right. And I believe that even if God assigns you somewhere, there can still be a downside to it. Mm-hmm. And there was, a, there was some discontent that I had as it relates to being a pastor. I mean, I, I love pastoring, but there was a downside to it that I couldn't ignore. Okay. And, you know, so I began to express it to God and, and talk to God about it. And then I realized that, you know, he was giving me work um, beyond the four walls of the church and that my greatest work is probably going to be done in the marketplace. Right. Um, w- one of the things that really uh, uh, concerned me about the church environment is that we don't have a lot of executors. Okay. And one thing uh, about the church is that, you know, we major in hearing, mm-hmm. we major in religious protocol, but we don't score high grades at execution. There's a reason why James wrote to be not hearers only, but doers, doers or executors or creators. Right. And um, certainly I want to be around creators and be amongst creators and then help those that had ideas, uh, uh, you know, t- to bring those ideas into manifestation. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know. Um, it's, 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 it's like Moses, so to speak. Here's Moses shepherding Jethro's sheep. You know, he's working in another man's field. And then in the form of a burning bush, you know, God shows up and says to him, okay, now I'm going to give you the idea for your life. Right. Like Moses didn't know he, he was going to be an author and write the first five books of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Moses didn't know that, that his legacy was going to be one as leading one of the greatest movements in the history of, of the world. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, I thought that I was just going to be a pastor and do that till I was 70 years old, but I didn't know that God had other ideas. So about five years ago, you know, I started a speaking and coaching business. Okay. And uh, because I come from those environments, I've come from corporate environments and I was able to have some success and uh, to be honest, um, I transitioned uh, more from speaking uh, to coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, my brand, you know, certainly has grown a lot more during the pandemic. Uh, but I, I find out that my, my sweet spot, although I have opportunities to speak on platforms, actually my sweet spot is not the stage. My sweet spot is working in small groups and doing one-on-one and group coaching. Okay. So that is the focus um, of of my business right now, and where most of the revenue at this time comes from. You know, that again, a, another powerful um, illustration of 
how God wants us to be used in this earth realm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Moses writing books, or let's look at it this way. You've had many aspects of your past mm -hmm. that God has allowed you to use for him in your future. Yes. You know, and uh, where you're impacting lives. And while you were talking, um, the scripture came to my mind where, where the Bible says, he that wins souls of the soul is wise. Mm -hmm. And I know that we can just keep that relative to salvation. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you, you, you can win a soul, not necessarily in terms of into Christ's kingdom, but you can win a soul through your, uh, through your, through your success and your, you know, uh, interactions with them. You can win them over to better living. You can win them over to um, change of mind, you know, all kinds of things. So, yes, I understand the, the principle of the, of the Christian text, but can be expanded because you won so you can win people to live a different life, to be inspired, to change the way they're thinking. That's winning somebody because if they're not doing what they used to do, guess what? You've won. You know, Dr. Walker, you... I cannot agree with you more with what you just said. We teach people in this environment that influence is evangelism. Right, right. Now, the scripture that you just quoted, the first part of that scripture is, uh, it is the fruit of the righteous that gives life. Not mm -hmm. the righteous themselves, but it's what the righteous produces that gives life, and he that wins souls is wise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the thing about it is, it's your productivity that's going to change lives because, that's because right. man looks at the outward appearance. That's right. And I believe that success, influence, prosperity is all about evangelism. Mm. You know, when people see your fruit and they begin to consume what you produce, in other words, when people see your life as exceptional, and what I mean by that is the word uh, exception means different. Right. You are the exception. You are different. When people see your life as different, they give you permission to lead them and influence them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, productivity and to your point, creativity is all about influence. Right. Because we're living in a day of time where it's not about passing out tracts or quoting scripture. It is about people gather, people don't gather to empty branches. They gather to fruit. They're influenced by the fruit that you produced. So to your point, um, you hit a home run on that. You know, if, if we're going to be influencers like we're called to be, then we have to be productive and we have to create. No question about that. No question. Do, do you focus any way on a particular group of people, black men, black women, people in general? Is there anyone that you focus on? Well, we, we focus, I, I myself focus on faith-based professionals and entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, because there, there are so many, you know, we've always been told that, that the ministry market or the Christian market is such a small market that will eventually run out. Right. And I've come to find out that that's a very rich market. Okay. You know, um, so when you're dealing with faith-based entrepreneurs and professionals, I mean, that they're, they're everywhere. They're in Chicago, they're in Dallas, they're here in Philadelphia, they're where you are. Mm -hmm. And and there's a huge market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly I resonate more with that community. And most of my clients are from that community because uh, we resonate um, at a high level. Right now, the the non-Christian market has given me permission, you know, to come into that market as well and do some work also. But you just simply switch the message. Right. Right. So, right. so I mean, uh, but most of of. I, I target faith-based professionals and entrepreneurs. Okay. You, you know, one of the things that we all have to accept when it comes to, you know, God's kingdom, you know, God's kingdom is the entire world. Mm -hmm. And, and I bring that up because you just said that, um, God, they're, they're, they're faith-based people, but you said, I think you said Chicago, you might've said New York as well as Philadelphia. But earlier today I was, driving in my car, went out for a run and came back. And my mind went to uh, the conference that you and I were in this past weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, give me the mic, you know, mm -hmm. with Dr. Will Moreland. 
And what jumped out to me while I was driving was that he is a person who God has taken around the world, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then he had on that call with us people who were in different parts of the world. We were all in the same room for, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that because I said to myself, I think that that might be the first time that I was in a room with people around the world. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, and I thought about it and I said, look where God has taken me. You know what I'm saying? Even though it was a zoom call, I've never been on a zoom. Everybody I know that I've ever been in a zoom call. It was like from, you know, West Philly, (laughs) Jersey, (laughs) but it's starting to expand. So what does that tell me? That tells me God is going to use you. God mm-hmm. is going to bless your gifts mm-hmm. and your gifts will not just be limited to your, to your, to your neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Although Dr. Will said you need to start in your neighborhood and maximize that first. Right. But eventually it's going to take you around the world. Right. And as some of the things that you're saying, you know, as I go back to your, your target audience, mm-hmm. that faith based, yes, sometimes it's going to be people who are secular, mm-hmm. but it's still, the kingdom. It's still Christ Jesus. You're still a representative of him. Um, I, a lot of people, well, not that people don't know about it, but I'm a former NCAA division one basketball referee. Okay. Yeah. I did that for about, about 25, 30 years. And I just recently retired from it. Mm -hmm. And I remember the years that I was pastoring. um, I remember a couple of times being on the road and ministering to people in the locker room and things like that. And one day the Lord said to me, he said, I don't, not only do I have you out here just to referee the game, but I I also have you out here to represent me because there'll be some people who you will bless because of that profession you're in Mm -hmm. and it will never walk into the doors of your church. Exactly. You know, and I said, look how good God is. God wants his people in the marketplace. So stop limiting yourselves to your local church, the four walls of the sanctuary, get out, go abroad and represent Christ and be an example unto him. Yes. Dr. Walker, I believe that purpose always leaves clues. Yes. Purpose always leaves clues. You know, you mentioned about the experience that that you had um, this past weekend. You yes, know, that that was not an accident. Right. You know, that was that was heavenly communication um, telling you um, that you've done some great things in life, but get ready for for new new markets and new territories and things of that nature. Mm. And, um, you know, certainly, you know, going back, I want to use Moses as an example. You know, one thing that Moses believed um, he believed that there was not a market for his message. Okay. The people are not going to embrace me. The people are not going to accept me. And I think that we get over concerned with markets and, and, and listeners. And we're concerned about things that God never told us to be concerned about. Right. He just said, go. It mm-hmm. is my responsibility to get you listeners. It is my responsibility to create a market for you. Mm. So you're so overwhelmed and you're hesitant because you feel like you don't bring value to a marketplace. And the, 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 the job for us to do is to simply go in the strength that we have. Right. You know, I may not, you know, oh man, let me add this real quick. Okay. Most of us have a lack consciousness And that means that we're more often aware of who we're not or what we don't have. Correct. Instead of who we are and what we do have. And we disqualify ourselves by saying things like, I can't, I've never done that before. I can't speak well. I mean, all these things that we do, and we're always aware of who we're not and what we don't have. Mm -hmm. And I think that that begins to diminish the ideas that God gives us as it relates to our next work. Because for Moses, that was his next work. So like myself, like you, there's a next work that we're going to do. And, uh, you know, to, to your point, you know, I believe that that environment was just evidence and the proof that God is serious about your next work. No question about that. No question. Amen. Well, I lift my hands up and I receive it. 
<laughs> um, I want to ask you this question. I usually ask it of all of my guests. Certainly. Um, you've done a lot of great things in your life and ministry and so on and so forth. But who would you say is the one or two people who were most influential to you? Man, uh, I, I would say uh, right now it's, it's my wife and Dr. Will Moreland. Okay. Um, tell me, tell me why for both of them. I mean, the wife might be kind of obvious, <laughs> well, but maybe wife, not, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> my wife just won't allow me to quit. Okay. You know, like I can, she just won't allow me. Um, and this is not that I have bouts with quitting all the time, but she's just a woman that has just wrapped belief around my life that okay. when I am out of belief, hers is there in abundance. Wow. You know, so she's very, very supportive and influential. And I thank God for that. And then, you know, Dr. Will Moreland, it's like, you know, who there's, you know, there's so many people out there, so many people doing some great things out there, but who do I organically resonate with? Mm. You know, who do like, like, because, one is too small of a number to be great. And there are people around us that I believe that God placed around us to help us to get to where we need to be. And, you know, I've, I've tried, you know, um, different speakers and different programs. And I mean, because everybody's doing some good things, but he is the one that I highly resonate with. And he's very influential. I love his story. I like how he shows up. So um, it's not just the business, it's the person he is, it's the mindset that he has. In other words, he has some intangibles that I want. Okay. He has some intangibles that I want. And I, I want to say this as well, is that uh, you can't, not you, you per se, but as, as people trying to get to the next level, we can't follow everybody. Right. You know, um, Jesus said that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. When you hear me speak, you've heard the Father. So that means you know who I've imitated. Right. You know who I've become like. Mm -hmm. And then he told the disciples, you know, to follow me for three years. Like, don't, don't, you know, there are different ideas and different programs, but follow my program for three years, and then you guys will begin to duplicate some of the same work. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's so much noise out here. We have to know what program, what person, whose information ideas am I supposed to consume? Right. And I believe that those people are out there and it's like, you know what, go deep with that person. You know, El Elisha was doing some great things in the world. And mm -hmm. if you was to ask Elisha, man, how are you doing all these great things? It is the man that I chose to follow eight years ago. You know, he was the man I imitated. He was the man I admired. He was the man that I resonated with. And because I've learned so much from him and I've gone deep with him, now I'm able to duplicate some of those great works um, or, do, or do higher works as well. So he's just somebody, you know, to answer the question, Dr. Will Moreland is just somebody that I just resonate with at a high level. So my wife and, and, and Dr. Will Moreland. Speaking of uh, Dr. Will, um, he, and I don't know whether you, uh, your book that's about to come out came through uh, his program, but I want to mention it now. You have a book coming out uh, called The Goal Standard, and you spell goal, G-O-A-L, The Goal Standard, How to Achieve One Big Goal and Do It Again and Again and Again. Tell us about the book and how did it come about? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of general work. When people say, hey, what do you do? You know, I've helped people to lose weight, start businesses, write books. So I realized that what I really do is I help people achieve their biggest goals. So I rebranded myself as a goals person. Mm. So um, I believe that there is no fulfillment of purpose maximization of talent uh great value given to the world 
in, in life creation without conforming to a goal standard. Okay. And many people have ideas, but they don't know the process of having a, of creating a goal achievement system from thought to plan to action. And uh, so in that book, I just talk about, you know, what it is. It's not the normal, you know, you have to set goals to, to stay focused and you have to set goals to, you know, to, to be governed um, by an idea. But, you know, there's a certain person you have to be even before you create goals. Mm. You know, you, you, you can't create goals like a person that has low self-esteem, a person that has a low self-worth or that's in a low state they'll never set high goals. Right. So in other words, it's who do you have to be before you, you be even begin to select ideas for your life. So it's a lot of that information that I deal with in the book. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to monopolize all the time. But I, I, I'm excited about the book. And the book is due to be released uh, sometime in mid-January. And we're, we're very, very excited about it. I'm excited for you because, yes, no doubt, it is all about uh, goal setting and and having, you know, and making it a standard, as you're saying in 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 the title. Yes. And uh, I know you could only write, or you only wrote the word again three times, but you could do it like a hundred times, right? <laughs> yeah, because here's here's the thing, Doctor Walker. <laughs> Once you understand how to achieve one big goal, uh -huh. you can take the same structure and the same system and use it for other things. That's right. So once you do it once, you can keep doing it again, again, and again. Yes, yes, yes. I like that. that that's, that's powerful. Um, what are you reading? Currently? Yeah. I'm, I'm reading, uh, well, <laughs> I'm reading Deep Work okay. by Cal Newport. Let me see the name. So, because somebody might be uh, Cal Newport, Deep Work. Okay. Tell me yeah. what that's about. Well, you know, most people, what they do in life is, is for most people, what they do in life is, is very shallow. Okay. They're not intimately connected and there's no depth to what they're doing and what they're creating. Okay. You know, most people are just going to work every day trying to survive you know, to get paid, but there's no real depth to their work. Okay. You know, most people don't even give their all, you know, to their work because there's nothing deep about it. There's right. no connection to it. Right. So, you know, deep work is just simply about who do you have to be? Like if, if you're going to be a heavyweight in the world, if you're going to be world class, then there has to be some depth, you know, to what you're doing. Mm. There has to be deep concentration. There has to be years given to the idea. Mm. You no, know, there has to be, uh, you know, most people, um, they are, they are uh, distracted from distracting, I mean, from, from distraction instead of being distracted from focus. In other words, what I mean by that is, is that most people spend their time distracted. Mm. And then what distracts them is about an hour of focus on what I have to do when distraction should be the distraction from focus work. Right. So we'll never get to deep work and we'll never produce, um, you know, world-class work unless we go deep, 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 deep. So the book talks about that, you know, rules for focused success in a distracted world. Because the two problems that mankind deals with at a high level, we are, we are weak in focus and we are poor in imagination. And you talked about it earlier. Weak mindsets and weak focus is the recipe for a mass production of mediocrity. Mm. And if we, can, if we can solve those two problems, I believe that we can change the world. No question about that. That's, that's, that's awesome. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It is all about the depth of what you're doing or want to do. Yeah. And I agree, most of us are, we do work at a surface level, and that's why we don't reach our goals. Exactly. Yeah, that's what exactly. we're doing. You know, uh, Pastor Frederick, I, I've just enjoyed this conversation with you today. And uh, as we get ready to close, um, I want you to leave us 
with an inspirational message, something that you can share with this audience that you can leave with us that we can take home with us? Yeah, I, I, I would like everyone to know that there was a, a, a big idea that preceded their existence. And I mean a, a, a huge idea. Whether you know it or not, you know, you are a, a product, not just a human being or, or a servant. Just like the, the iPhone or the iPad is, is the master creation of Steve Jobs and Apple, you know, or, or a great painting is, is the master creation of Picasso. You know, we are the master creation of, of God. Mm. We are not junk. We are his idea and we are products um, that are supposed to serve the marketplace and serve the generation that we're called to. So I just want everybody to know that whether you know it or not, you know, life, God does not work chronologically. I'm 25 now, I'm 50 now, I'm 70 now. That is not the mindset of God as it relates to when life begins. Mm. So life begins at discovery and life begins when you begin to take his big idea serious for your life. So I just want to inspire you, you know, where you are does not matter. It's going to happen from where you are. What you've gone through does not matter. All that matters is, is where you want to be. And God is ready to release all of heaven's resources to help you get to your spot in this world. So I, I want to encourage you, you know, to just, to just have the courage to accept the idea that, 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 that brought about your existence in this world. And it is a huge idea. Absolutely it is. Pastor Fred, I want to thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, just give us, uh, how can we contact you on social media? You know what? You can just simply uh, go, go to Facebook. My name is on, on the screen, Frederick Gyans, G-U-I-O-N-S. You can go to my website, frederickgyans.com. And if you want to purchase the book, um, uh, thegoldstandardbook.com. And all that information is there and available. Well, Pastor Fred, I thank you for joining us today. Uh, on the show, you have been, uh, you have inspired us, you've motivated us, you've encouraged us uh, to, you know, to go deep inside of our hearts and find out what God has already put in there. Yes. And what he's put in there, put that at work, uh, set yourself for goal or few goals mm -hmm. and uh, live by the gold standard. So uh, Pastor Fred, as I say to all of my guests who come on the show, you have gone beyond the culture and I thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. You take care. Now, if you want to continue to hear inspiring interviews like the one you heard today, I want you to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. Also, rate the show and please leave a comment. I would also love it if you would share this podcast with your friends to let them know that we're on. Finally, please go to our website at www.beyondtheculturepodcast.com or you can email me at beyondtheculturepodcast at gmail.com. On the website, you can subscribe to the show and connect with me by leaving your email address. I'd love to hear from you. This is your host, Dr. David Walker, and we'll talk again on Beyond the Culture. Take care. <laughs>